I'm Shane Snyder. I'm a software developer at Argon, and one of the uh, tools I spend a lot of my time working on is a tool called uh, Darshan, which we'll talk a lot about today for uh, monitoring and giving you some feedback on IA performance and characteristics of your application. Um, so it's an important problem, obviously. So some example questions you might have while you're, you're getting started is um, how much time is spent um, reading and writing files by your application? Um, how, how does that compare to the overall runtime of the application? Are you spending a you know, majority of your time in I.O. or is it negligible? Um, does it get better or worse as you scale up? Um, that's obviously an important problem that we uh, deal with a lot. Um, and then there's a performance portability question. So does it get better or worse? Or is it kind of the same across different platforms? Um, and then also, what, um, how, how should you prior, prioritize your I.O. tuning to get the, the most um, bang for your buck? Um, so we generally uh, recommend using Darshan for this type of, type of work. Um, and like I said, this, this presentation, uh, we'll look at a lot of different, or we'll, we'll kind of present some background knowledge on how to use Darshan on, on uh, the Theta system that you guys have access to. Um, and then later today, we'll look at some more detailed examples where um, we dig through some Darshan data um, to enable different insights into application I.O. behavior. So we'll just start off by uh, giving you guys an idea of what Darshan is. It's a, it's a I.O. characterization tool meant specifically for um, HPC applications. Um, so basically what it does is it captures a concise view of um, the I.O. behavior of each, each job at instruments, um, and it does so with minimal overhead. Um, so um, some key uh, characteristics about Darshan is that it's widely available. So it's deployed at um, you know, lots of different HPC facilities, um, including you know, most of the DOE um, facilities, including ALCF, OLCF, and uh, NURSE that you guys um, have access to for AppBesk. Um, it's easy to use, so it doesn't require any changes to your code or your development process necessarily. Um, and it's got um, negligible performance impacts, so that kind of lends itself to the the full-time deployment at facilities is that it's not um, perturbing applications. It's, it's more or less unnoticeable to them. That's one of the big um, you know, uh, des design philosophy for, for Darshan. And as I mentioned, it, it produces a summary for each, um, a summary of IO activity for each job that it instruments. Um, so uh, this is generally a, a good starting point for, for users when you use Darshan. We generally recommend using uh, this Darshan job summaries um, in this uh, you know, includes um, you know, statistics and counters, like how many oper IO operations are issued, um, how much time was spent doing various operations and things like that. Um, so a little more about how, how Darshan works. Um, traditionally, it's been tied very much to MPI applications. So for a while, it um, required that you be using MPI. Um, we'll cover it a little bit more in my afternoon session, um, but Darshan also does allow you to instrument non-MPI applications now. So if that's something you're interested, then, then stay, stay tuned for that. Um, but essentially what it does is it inserts um, instrumentation into your, your application, uh, either when it's compiled for uh, statically linked executables or when it's executed for uh, um, dynamically linked executables. Um, and basically what happens is Darshan defines these instrumentation wrappers that uh, intercept every single I.O. call made by the application, and then it'll record statistics um, about those accesses. And, uh, and what it does is it stores all that information in a bounded set of memory at each process. Um, so this, this part of the desi design is meant to kind of, you know, cap um, Darshan's memory usage so it's um, not intrusive for the, the application. Um, then what happens is uh, once the the application terminates, Darshan's done instrumenting all the I.O. calls. Um, Darshan will uh, you know, collect all the, the different file records and statistics and things like that. It'll you know, filter out and compress and then write these all to a single log file um, that users can then um, have a look at. So part, part of Darshan is obviously some uh, command line tools that allow you to inspect the contents of the log file or to, to generate some, some summary information that gives you an idea about uh, the general I.O. behavior of the, the job. Um, so a little bit more about using Darshan. So as I mentioned, we'll be focusing uh, exclusively on data today and in the, the examples in the following slides and in the afternoon session. Um, well, I'll have the uh, link to the hands-on exercises up in the upper right corner all day if you guys need to, to refer back to it. Um, but that's essentially where we're keeping all of our hands-on exper uh, experiments and uh, some, some scripts that'll help you guys set up your environment to properly have access to all the different tools today. 
Um, just want to briefly mention that other systems are extremely similar. Um, the, the, the key differences are pretty um, subtle. Um, so, so for one, um, Darshan installed a different facility other, or different system other than Theta. Um, the location of the log file is obviously something that you'll have to um, be aware of. That obviously changes. Um, also, the analysis utility avail availability. Um, Darshan's um, analysis utilities have some dependencies that may be a little difficult to install, like on login nodes or on supercomputers. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind, um, what, what kind of works where. Um, and then um, also, you know, whether Darshan's even available by default in the first place. I think all the systems that, um, that, I, that I mentioned, Darshan's on by default, so it should just kind of be there. Um, but you, you may need to, to load it at other facilities. Um, so we'll start with uh, Theta, and as I, as I mentioned, um, probably what you'll, or sorry, so first you'll, um, you can just kind of verify that Darshan's available. So Theta has a software module system that you can just use this module list command to see what's uh, currently loaded, um, and you should, should see Darshan 330 um, on Theta, um, just already on and uh, available for you. If for some reason it's not there, then you can just use module load command to, to load Darshan. Um, the next step is really simple. So all you need to do is compile and run your application. Um, so that software module kind of integrates Darshan directly into the compiler wrappers that you would use on these, these systems. So it kind of transparently takes care of all of the, the linking in of Darshan libraries and, and things like that. Um, so there's not really anything you need to do other than just make sure to compile and, and run. Um, there is a, a slight caveat in that your application um, and this default Darshan configuration, that is, you know, the, the, uh, the MPI mode for Darshan, um, you need to both call MPI initialize and MPI finalize. Um, so if you accidentally left out MPI finalize or something like that, then you're, you're definitely not going to get a Darshan log. Okay, so the next step is your, your application's terminated, um, so then you can just look around for your, your Darshan log file. Um, Generally speaking, at facilities, all the Darshan logs go into a single uh, directory um, for all users. Um, for, all, you know, for newer Darshan versions that are installed at all these facilities, there's a command that you can use to get this path. So Darshan config dash dash log path will give you the complete log directory location, which I have shown here for Theta. It's on the Luster file system. Um, within that uh, centralized directory, uh, the there's you know, further subdirectories broken down based on the date. So then there's a, a year, uh, then a month, then a day directory. Um, and, and obviously, but what's happening here is Starshan is just storing all the logs for a single day in, in, in one directory. So if you know when your, your job ran, then that um, gives you information on where to, to look for it. Um, one thing definitely worth mentioning for Theta, and that it's a little odd, is that it's using GMT time zone. Um, so you may not find the log on the exact day that you, you, you thought you ran it. So I think it's at 7 p.m. local time, it rolls over to um, tomorrow basically with uh, GMT. So that's something to keep in mind on the, the theta system in particular. Um, within those uh, day directories, um, you can find um, log files um, basically using your username or your, your app name. Um, so all of them are formatted in the same exact way. So it starts off with your username, then the application name, uh, followed by a job ID, and then some, some other metadata is encoded into the file name. Um, but then once you've found what you, um, which log you're looking for, um, generally what we recommend is copying it somewhere else where you can kind of work on it in place without uh, creating files and stuff like that in the uh, central Darshan log directory. So the next step is to generate the uh, summary, um, job summary um, plots that we, we, we discussed earlier. Um, so this is where you'll need to kind of set up, if you want to do this on Theta, then you'll need to use this uh, uh, software setup uh, environment setup script. It's this uh, theta-setup-env um, script that's in the, the hands-on repo. Um, we also you know, generally recommend users a lot to just copy it to your, your laptop or whatever system that you use um, that you it's generally a little bit easier to install different Darshan dependencies when you have c control over that sort of stuff. So um, that's something that a lot of users tend to tend to do. Um, so essentially, once once you've sourced that that setup script on Theta, then you can run this Darshan job summary script uh, directly. It's a, a Perl script that takes just a uh, Darshan log file name as input. Um, and then what it does is it produces a PDF file as output um, with the same exact name, just with a, a PDF extension, so it's, it's easy to find. 
Um, just a quick note about other systems in case um, they're, they're useful for folks here. Um, it's really kind of simple, as I, as I mentioned earlier. For both Cori and Summit, Darshan's already on and enabled by default, uh, you know, automatically. Um, and they have slightly different uh, log file locations here uh, for reference if it's useful for you. Um, and all, all these systems, you can use this tool called Darshan Parser just to dump out all of the uh, log file contents just in uh, text format. Um, it's kind of cumbersome to dig through that and find out useful information, but that, that does work everywhere. Um, the Darshan Job Summary Perl script, again, is something that you might need to do some uh, additional setup for um, to get the proper you know, Perl dependencies and things like that set up. Um, so next I'll step through um, this uh, a general job analysis example. So this is where we've created a uh, PDF um, that gives us details on application IO behavior using the Darshan job summary tool I just mentioned. So basically it's just a, a multi-page PDF with all kinds of different graphs and tables and um, statistics and things like that that give you a, a high level overview of what the application IO workload was. Um, and we'll, we'll step through some of the, the highlights over the next uh, few slides. Um, so starting off with some simple job metadata, the, the, the PDF header has the executable name and job date, um, just for your reference. And then we also have another table kind of giving you more details on the, the job ID, um, the user ID, um, how many processes the job used, um, and runtime. And then um, further down, we have some, some general performance estimates that we want to keep just near the top of the, the summary report just to kind of give users a high level you know, overview of what, what types of performance numbers were achieved by the application. So you can see in this, this instance, this application uh, did eight gigs of IO um, using the MPIO layer and um, um, had a, a bandwidth of basically 330 megabytes per second. Um, you can see the performance disparity here between the two um, layers that we, we looked at here, um, MPIO and standard IO. And the, the reason's pretty um, simple in that the, the MPIO layer was used for bulk like application data, so it was able to get higher performance. And the standard IO was just kind of reading in a config file for this example, so it was very small um, and can't get much uh, sustained uh, throughput, basically. So next we'll step through some of the example plots that you'll see as you um, thumb through the different pages of the report. Um, so one that's really useful, um, it kind of ref uh, refers back to something I mentioned on my, my first slide, but just getting a, your bearings on how, how much IO uh, is done by the application and uh, specifically relative to the application runtime. So you can see here for this particular plot, we have you know, across a few different um, IO interfaces, the relative cost um, of different IO operations. So we break this down for read operations, write operations, and metadata operations. And you can see um, for POSIX and MPIO, it's very similar in that um, this, um, this workload's doing maybe upwards of 80% of the IO time is, or of the application time is spent doing writes. And there's a small fraction doing metadata here. This is an example of an application that would be, probably be interesting to look at for you know, IO, uh, IO tuning, and that you're spending a ton of your time here on IO. If it was a very, like for a standard IO where there's basically no IO shown, that's, not, that's, not obviously, that's obviously not a good candidate for performance tuning. Um, and this particular example is a benchmark, so that, that makes sense that the majority of the time is spent doing IO. Um, the next plot is on the right side, the uh, IO operation counts. It shows you across a few different um, APIs, so including POSIX and different um, MPIO APIs, and also standard IO, um, how many operations were issued. Um, so in this case, you can see you know, upwards of you know, 33,000 or something like that um, write calls. Um, so one thing to keep an eye out for here is that um, you know, large numbers of um, metadata operations, things like seeks or syncs or things like that, um, that could be a sign of um, inefficient I.O., so that's something to, to look for in these plots if you're seeing a lot of, um, of these metadata operations. They can really kind of drive down your efficiency um, for I.O. Um, next, we'll look at the um, access size histogram, which we have here on the left side for the uh, MPIO module. So essentially what this is doing is it's showing you um, the, the full range of accesses and the total count of different access uh, sizes that your application um, issues. So generally speaking, um, I'm sure we've, we've heard a little bit about this today, these parallel file systems really prefer um, big um, access sizes. Um, so small access sizes are something to kind of keep an eye out for in these plots. If you're seeing a ton of, um, 
if you're seeing a ton of accesses towards the left side, then that's something that you might um, consider trying to have a closer, closer look at. Um, you'd, pr you'd prefer to see um, the majority of your accesses you know, in the, the megabyte or, or more range. Um, we also have tables that kind of give you an idea of the types of files your application accessed and roughly how much um, data was accessed from them. So in this uh, table, um, we have you know, different rows for the total number of files accessed or read-only files, write-only files, and read-write files. And you can see we keep an, an average and max size of how much data was accessed from those, basically. Um, we can also provide some really basic timing bounds um, by default for read and write activity. So shown here is a couple of um, plots with, uh, with read on the top and write on the bottom showing um, for each rank um, roughly what, what uh, uh, portions of the application were spent doing read or write. So you can see that there's a, a write phase in this particular example on the bottom followed by a read phase across all processes. Um, so that's just, 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 just to like roughly give you an idea of what uh, ranks are doing what over, over time. Um, just want to quickly point out to, you know, that this, this Starshan job summary is a really helpful way to kind of get your bearings and to start thinking about what your, your um, specific application is doing from an IO perspective. Um, but always keep in mind that your, uh, your facility staff is always there to, to help. So this might be a good, good tool to use to kind of bring some, some numbers um, to get feedback from, from those folks if you have specific questions about a system. Um, there, there are more um, graphs that I didn't show. I just wanted to kind of cover some of the highlights. So have a closer look at the uh, summary tool and um, see if you have any uh, specific questions. And as I mentioned, um, this is just like a, a summary tool. It's, you know, it's just a kind of like a getting started thing. Um, there's also, um, the ability to extract more uh, detailed information out of Darshan, but you generally um, would want to do that if you have a specific uh, analysis task at, in mind or something like that. Um, I'll briefly mention um, how you might obtain some finer grain details with Darshan. So I'm going to refer back to the, the, the time bound uh, graphs that I was just talking about where different ranks are, um, where you're getting visualizations on which ranks are doing reads or writes at, at what time. Um, in the case of shared files, this is, um, there's a, a slight issue in that uh, Darshan by default for shared files is doing something a little different. So if every, every process app accesses the same file, then Darshan has an additional step where we collapse all of the different file records down into one. So we're basically reducing all the information down into to one record. And what that does is it saves us a lot of space um, in the log file because we're, you know, we're not having n numbers of records for these, these files and just have one. But it also throws out a lot of the information and the details about what these different ranks are doing. So you can see down here in the very bottom pane shows um, the read-write um, bounds for a shared file application. You can see it's very coarse-grained information and not super helpful. Um, and that's just because all of the, the timing information has been collapsed down across all ranks. So it's kind of been um, lost, more or less. Um, one thing you can consider doing is disabling that shared reduction step. Um, so again, this is just really useful if you have some shared file um, accesses that you just really want to know more details about without having Darshan do this additional kind of optimization. So in this case, whenever you um, enable the Darshan disable shared reduction environment variable, it'll skip that step and then you get to retain all of the per process details, which can be really useful depending on what you're, what you're trying to, uh, to figure out. Um, maybe more useful, um, but even more overhead is Starshan's um, extended tracing ability. So you can set an additional environment variable, DXT enable IO trace, and this will give you a full trace of every IO operation issued by the application. So you know, by default, Darshan just captures a, a bounded amount of information for each file, so it obviously can't track every single, um, all the details of every single operation by default. But in this mode, we do capture all that information, so you'll know um, for every single you know, read or write issued, you'll know um, which rank did it, um, what file offset it was at, um, what size it was, and when it started and when it finished. Um, so that can be really useful for um, um, higher fidelity analysis. Um, obviously, it's going to create a lot of overhead in terms of runtime memory usage and, and log file sizes, but depending on um, what you're doing, um, that, that's maybe a price you're willing to pay. This is something that we don't have enabled uh, by default just because we don't want every single application running on the supercomputers to be generating this much um, characterization data, um, but it is available if, it's, if you think it's useful. Um, we do have a, a DXT-specific parser, which you can use to dump out the, uh, the text 
um, version of all of the, the trace data. There's also a really simple analysis script for, dump, or for generating a plot, uh, basically ranks uh, read and write activity over time using DXT uh, data. So this is similar to the time span plots we've kind of already covered, but obviously it's much um, finer grained details um, about what ranks are doing um, in, in terms of read and write activity. Um, and again, this can be really helpful for identifying when um, I.O. is uh, happening across different ranks. Um, you can see in this particular example, there appears to be a, a couple of different uh, phases going on. And also what's interesting is there's a, a subset I.O. Um, behavior basically going on. You can see the, the big gaps um, vertically going up across ranks. So only a, only, um, you know, a subset of ranks are actually performing I.O. for this particular example as opposed to all of them. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop with the, or end a little bit with a, a recap here. So we've, we've just started off with some really basic Darshan usage and tips. So you guys um, should have some ideas about how to use it on data specifically now, but um, always keep in mind that uh, facilities that have Darshan generally have their own uh, documentation giving details about how, how users can uh, use it properly. So keep an eye out for that. Um, so, you know, Darshan is generally what we recommend for a starting point here. It's like just because it's deployed everywhere and, and obviously because it's a tool that we spend a lot of time working on. Um, and it's basically, you know, on, on all these systems, it's probably already instrumenting your application, whether you're aware of it or not. Um, and as, as we kind of walk through, the, the PDF summaries are generally what we um, point users to for a, a starting point um, to kind of get a, a high level overview of IO behavior. Um, but we can always help if, uh, if users have specific questions um, that they can't quite uh, figure out from there. Um, and I'll, I'll be back later in the afternoon to do a little bit more um, in-depth kind of overview of t understanding and tuning IO uh, using uh, Darshan data. I um, want to quickly mention some hands-on exercises that you guys um, should be able to, to try out, I guess, when our um, reservation starts up pretty soon. Um, so feel free to work on these whenever you have time throughout the day or tonight um, and, and see what you can find out. But basically, there's a, a few different applications. There's a simple Hello World application that's just a good starting point for making sure that you can run something on these systems and that you can generate the uh, corresponding Darshan log and then generate a, a PDF summary for it. Um, then there's some, uh, a couple of other uh, <clears throat> examples called Warp Drive and Fidget Spinner, and each of these have um, a and B versions, basically. So there's, uh, there's definite differences between the, the versions that you can see um, reflected in the, the performance data that you get out of Darshan, and also, obviously, in the, the differences in the code. So, so the idea is um, to try and figure out what, which one performs better in each case and what the, the difference is that, that leads to that. Um, those are just good examples to kind of work through the whole, you know, digging through a Darshan log file and um, and also the code just to kind of see what, what's going on. Um, and those will, those will both be a lot easier to, to understand and walk through after um, Rob Latham does our MPIO presentations later this morning. Um, but obviously, um, have, have a look at those and check in with us if you have any specific questions or comments, um, and we'd be happy to, to help you out. <laughs>